I just want to give a brief content warning before I start the podcast. There's going to be discussions of racism, specifically anti-blackness, and a mention of police harassment. If this is something that you don't think you'd be able to handle hearing about, then I won't mind if you skip this episode. Hello! We are on episode 3 of the podcast. I can't believe we've gotten here. The third episode in the third month of 2022. I'm doing amazing. I'm very proud. This month's theme to celebrate International Women's Day and Women's History Month, the theme is Ladies, 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 which is all about cinema surrounding queer women. And this episode, we're going to be talking about the Watermelon Woman. Her name, the Watermelon Woman. That's right, Watermelon Woman. Is Watermelon Woman her first name, her last name, or is it her whole name? I don't know, but Girlfriend has it going on, and I think I've figured out what my project's going to be on. I'm going to make a movie about her. I'm going to find out what her real name is, who she was and is, everything I can find out about her. Because something in her face, something in the way she looks and moves is, is serious, is interesting. And I'm going to just tell you all about it. The Watermelon Woman is the 1996 feature debut by Cheryl Donier, featuring the director as the lead character, a black lesbian who begins a film project where she tries to track down and document the identity of the titular figure who has been obscured and seemingly forgotten from history. Interspersed with Cheryl's documentary project is her everyday life where she works in a video rental shop, hangs out with her best friend Tamara, and tries to navigate her new relationship with a white woman, who she suspects may be fetishizing her black identity. Candid, whilst remaining incredibly funny, the watermelon woman takes a look at a part of lesbian identity often missing from mainstream depictions of queerness and makes race an integral part of how black women navigate their own sexualities. Foregrounding a woman who history was trying to forget and emphasising the ways that black women have not been part of the reclamation of history being very queer. In 1996, the film won the Teddy Award for Best Feature Film at the Berlin International Film Festival, and the Audience Award for Outstanding Narrative Feature at LA Outfest. It also received a Retrospective Legacy Award in 2021 from Cinema Eye Honours. It has a 91% critic score on Rotten Tomatoes and a 4 on Letterboxd. I came up with a recurring segment on this podcast where I would read the top reviews from Letterboxd and sort of see the general consensus of how this film was received by audiences. We have a review from user Lucy who succinctly said, I could watch hours more of this, insightful and delightful. Demi Adijuibe said the film was funny and incisive. Big fan of the way Dunye uses differing but very defined lesbian characters to explore intersectional lesbianism. Didn't expect the ending. Neither did I, honestly. The first time that I watched it, I was so shocked that, well, I'm not going to spoil it yet, but that ending hits you very hard, especially when you've gone on this whole journey. <laughs> Uh, expecting one thing and then you just come to a sudden realization and it's quite sad (laughs) if i'm being honest ayo edibiri says imagine if we lived in a world where black queer filmmakers got hbo deals and tv shows and opportunities to build their careers from their daring debut features just imagine many of the top reviews seem to agree that the film is very good and they're also very saddened that there aren't enough films like it. There seems to be a frustration with the lack of opportunities that black queer women get to have. The film is singular and kind of revolutionary, but it shouldn't have to be. And I think many people kind of clocked onto it. They seem to just have wanted more stuff like this and were shocked that this is kind of the only film like this. And the sad thing, really, is that things haven't gotten that much better. So I've got some statistics. They're very sad, so brace yourself. In January 2021, GLAAD reported that 23% of queer characters on broadcast TV were black, with a higher percentage on cable and a lower percentage on streaming. However, in film, Just two of the 20 LGBT plus characters who appeared in major studio releases were black. Another not so fun fact about this film, which when I was researching came up a lot because it is something to praise but it's also kind of incredibly sad. So upon its release, The Watermelon Woman made history as the first narrative feature to be released by an out black lesbian filmmaker. 
and that was in 1996. It's very sad, isn't it? That was only 26 years ago. That was the first film made by a black lesbian. Right, so here is where I'm going to give my spoiler warning. I haven't talked much about the film yet, so whilst we're all aware of how good it is, and that's kind of one of a kind, I haven't gone into details as of yet, so if you haven't seen the film, I would recommend watching it before listening to the rest of this podcast, because I am going to spoil a lot of it when I talk about it. Can you believe it? Faye's a sapphic sister, a bull dagger, a lesbian. Oh my gosh, I knew something was up when I saw Plantation Memories. But with Martha Page, hmm, Faye was really swinging back then. The film is very focused on lesbian desire and it's very specific about it and very explicit. And what I mean by that is it's talking about a very specific experience rather than a vague, they could be gay, but they will always return to men and any kind of lesbian desire will be for the benefit of the male audience and that isn't what is depicted here. What we see is a woman who is pursuing this documentary project and as she goes deeper and deeper in she discovers that the watermelon woman known as Faye Richards, that's her real name, was also gay. And as we uncover more and more about her, we learn that she was a lot more than the stereotypical, it's called a mammy figure, which was a caricature in many films in American cinema, where there was this kind of black woman who was a maid who cared for a white woman who was often a main character and she was often desexualized and off to the side and often responding to what white women were desiring which were often men but as we deep dive into this woman's history we see that not only was she gay not only did she have relationships with women but she was desired by women and in some way, Cheryl, the main character, desires Faye Richards. I think some of that comes from just finding someone you think is beautiful to look at and then suddenly finding out that they're very similar to you in in the modern day. But I think what Donier is doing here is trying to unpick and complicate the stereotypes that are often applied to black women. At no point do we feel like the lesbians in this film are over sexualized they just seem to speak very candidly about their sex lives and Dunye is the same in the way that she portrays sex there is a very long sex scene in the film and it seems to prioritize the women's pleasure and almost forgets about the camera and forgets that people are watching in the same way that Tamara and Cheryl talk about sex Dunye depicts it in a very frank way an article on Criterion called Turn the Gaze Around discusses this sex scene in detail there is a genuine eroticism to these positive representationally complex images of passionate lesbian lovemaking so rarely seen on screen there's also a marked lack of the kind of objectification seen in the mainstream, often male-directed lesbian sex scenes. It seems pretty popular at the moment to talk about the female gaze, and I think if we dig into that, I think all we mean is just stuff that feels very human and feels as though the women in the scene are having a good time, and the women watching the scene don't feel alienated or as if they're not being spoken to. Moreover, Dunye shoots women in a very particular way. It's often them being able to lead the scene and also just be funny and weird, but also at the same time very intimate. It feels very human, which I think goes along with the documentary style that Dunye applies here. Another thing that I think we can tie into the way desire is depicted is something that isn't discussed that often, I, I don't think, in films at least, is the way that white women fetishize black women's experiences. And I'm specifically talking about the character of Diana, who is very... <laughs> How do we describe her? Very bohemian, very just, oh, I'm just doing this, I'm just doing that. She doesn't seem to have any problems and just seems like far too 
called to be wherever she is. And we learn that Diana has had three black ex-boyfriends. It seems as if, or it's at least implied as if, Diana is a culture vulture, or she is specifically seeking out black people to use and discard their experiences. I suppose what I will say is that I think in Dunye's exploration of this black lesbian from history, that seems to be the focus. So in my opinion, I feel like the stuff with Diana could have been built upon a bit more. I know that it's meant to be like subtle. I'm not saying it's done poorly. It just, it feels like it's mentioned that Diana might be fetishizing Cheryl and then by the end of the film they've broken up so we kind of have to piece together what happened. Diana seems to be mostly on the sidelines of this story which I suppose is intentional. She is a side character. It does seem to be an inversion of the like the the black best friend in in the um, romantic comedy. Dunye seems to intentionally keep her off to the sidelines and make sure that Faye's story remains the focus rather than Diana pushing her way into the center. So along with kind of this subversion of what it means to be a lesbian or what it means to desire women, we see that Dunye is subverting what it means to desire black women specifically and the way that Cheryl desires Faye and her story seems more delicate and more intentional than the way Diana kind of comes in and out of Cheryl's life without intention or respect really. I, I really am distressed with a lot of the tone of recent uh, African-American scholarship. Um, it tries to say about the mammy that, um, that her, her largest of figure is desexualizing, uh, degrading, dehumanizing, um, and this seems to me so utterly wrong. Where the large woman is a symbol of, uh, of abundance and fertility is a kind of uh, goddess figure. Uh, even the, the presence of the mammy in the kitchen, it seems to me, has been misinterpreted. Uh, oh, the woman in the kitchen is a slave. A, a servant, a subordinate. Well, my grandmothers, my Italian grandmothers, never left the kitchen. In fact, this is why I dedicated my first book to them. And 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 Hattie McDaniel and Gone with the Wind is a spitting image of my of my grandmother in her in her style and her attitude and her ferocity and so on. It brings tears to my eyes. The watermelon seems to me an, another image that has been misinterpreted by by a lot of uh, black commentary. The the great extended family Italian get-togethers that I remember as a child ended with the the men bringing out a watermelon and uh, in ritualistically cutting it and distributing the pieces to everyone, almost like the communion service. I, and I, I really dislike this kind of a, a reductionism of, of a picture, let's say, of a, of a small black boy with, with a watermelon, him smiling broadly over it, looking at that as negative. Why is that not instead a symbol of, of joy and pleasure and, and, uh, and a fruitfulness? And after all, a piece of watermelon has the colors of the Italian flag, red, <laughs> uh, white, and green, so I'm biased in, to that extent. But I think that um, if the watermelon symbolizes African American American culture, rightly so, because because uh, it would look what uh, white middle class feminism stands for: anorexia and bulimia. So, what you've just heard was an excerpt from academic Camille Paglia, and she plays herself, and she seems to represent the white academics who feel entitled to black people's histories and redefining them in terms of whiteness. So, we hear that she specifically has issues with the watermelon being seen as a racist symbol. There's a lot to unpack there. All I'm gonna say is that white academics seem to, at least in terms of how they're represented in the film, they seem to want to talk about the way in which black people are feeling too offended by history rather than discussing this kind of stuff in context of history because it's fairly obvious that watermelons on their own are not racist against black people. However, <laughs> they have specifically been used to caricature black people and when you have a history that refused to see them as complex people, that can feel offensive. The fact that the film is called The Watermelon Woman seems to kind of take aim at that because for a good chunk of the film we don't know Faye's name. She is only referred to as the watermelon woman and even then she's often a footnote in white filmmakers biographies. She barely has a mention in almost all of the academic texts 
that Cheryl seeks out. The only way that we know who she is is from anecdotal stories from her partner. So I have a quote from an interview that Cheryl Dunye did about the watermelon woman. I did the research, I did look in black film history, and I found nothing but homophobia and the mission. I did look at queer film history, I read Vito Russo, and found no mention of race. So I hope that my film spurs these younger people to think about their identities within the context of representation in the media. I'm going to discuss this more in a second, but we see the ways that Faye, this character of the watermelon woman, she doesn't get to be a whole person for all of history. <laughs> She doesn't get to be a person. And then when we do find out about her, there is also the erasure of her queerness. So she's been tackled on several levels, being erased multiple times in multiple ways. The lesbian archives, very amazingly called the clit archives, they don't have a lot on black queer people from history. The black lesbian collection is said to be very separate from the rest. Obviously this whole section is very funny because it's the the whole archive is very unorganized already. So we see that there is very little desire in general to see queer history being diligently recorded and taken notice of. And black lesbian history is just in a box very separate from the rest. And you know we learn that almost everything that's in the archive altogether has been donated from people because historians haven't bothered to collect the stuff that would be necessary to remember these people. Faye is only in that one box. She doesn't appear anywhere else, seemingly. I mean, it seems fairly obvious if you have been aware of discussions of different types of oppression online you may have come across the word intersectionality and this film was way ahead of its time in that it was criticizing the different ways that black lesbian women are marginalized on all of those fronts as black people as queer people and as women so if you don't know or you haven't heard of intersectionality for what it is. I will just give a brief rundown. So intersectionality was a term coined in 1989 by Kimberly Crenshaw to describe how race, class, gender and other individual characteristics intersect with one another and overlap. She first laid out her theory when she published a paper in the University of Chicago's legal forum titled Demarginalizing the Intersection of Race and Gender. And the paper centered on three legal cases that dealt with the issues of both racial discrimination and sex discrimination. The law seemed to forget that black women were both black and female and that they would be discriminated on the basis of both at the same time. Efforts to fight racism would require examining other forms of prejudice. Efforts to eliminate gender disparities would require examining how women of colour experience gender bias differently from white women. So she kind of put that forward and it had a, the word had a resurgence on the internet around the time that feminism came back into the public consciousness. So there is a chance that you are kind of aware of the word even if you didn't know specifically what it meant. But just to summarise, it is the way that different avenues of oppression can be targeting a person at the same time. Like it's not just racism or just homophobia or just misogyny, how all of these can work within the structures of a white, straight, patriarchal society. What she means to me, a 25 year old black woman means something else. It means hope, it means inspiration, it means possibility, it means history. And most importantly what I understand is that I'm going to be the one who says, I am a black lesbian filmmaker who's just beginning, but I'm going to say a lot more and have a lot more work to do. When discussing queer history, race seems like a topic that many filmmakers don't want to tackle and I think it's because it's very difficult to talk about and it's very difficult to be critical of the ways that you could be oppressive. There is this idea that if you are experiencing some kind of queer phobia that there is no way that you could also be racist but clearly that's untrue because most of the queer stories 
the queer films that we get are still very white. Which is not to say there hasn't been any black queer films, but they've been significantly less. And supposedly, according to, I don't know, production companies who don't seem to want to touch the films about black queerness, they don't sell. I mean, that's, that just seems to be an excuse though, doesn't it? Because that's true of like any time any filmmaker wants to make a story that's not about white straightness. Around the time that this film was made was really an interesting time for queer cinema because it seemed to be a heyday for indie filmmakers who wanted to just make a film about anything. I've got some just like some brief history about black queer representation in cinema from Nerdist. Filmmaking in the 80s began to take a distinctive black queer perspective in response to the homophobia present in mainstream black movies. These films highlighted the HIV AIDS epidemic, which mainstream black films chose to ignore. So that would be filmmakers like Marlon Riggs and Isaac Julian. The 90s is when we started to see a noticeable increase of queer characters with more nuance in black movies. Set it off and Get on the Bus, both released in 1996, gave us interesting black, lesbian and gay characters. Dunye is very clever with this film because <laughs> it's a film made by Cheryl Dunye about a character called Cheryl making a film. <laughs> Which I just think is very funny. And the film adopts this documentary style and we see as it goes on, it's made up of interviews and archive footage that Cheryl is trying to create a history that just hasn't been available to her. So she will do things like interview residents from Philadelphia to see if they have any idea who the watermelon woman was. And we see various clips and no one seems to know. We get the idea throughout that Faye was not the type of person that history wanted to remember and it is Cheryl's job to fight against that and argue that in fact she was and that she was a complex person and we see Cheryl go to her mum who has stories about Faye that in fact she was remembered she just wasn't written down. We see the way that oral storytelling and anecdotal sources have been the main thing keeping Faye's memory alive because mainstream academia historians, filmmakers, even black historians in the film just didn't know that she existed, didn't want to know, didn't think she was important enough to be remembered. So this kind of documentary style seems to be directly going up against the classical Hollywood style and we see it in kind of this archive footage of various films that Faye had been in. They're very reminiscent of films like Gone with the Wind, which would be the traditional mainstream big Hollywood picture. This film instead is very small and a collage together and as a result it feels as though the film is rebelling against a type of filmmaking that oppressed this woman so much that she wasn't even remembered enough to have her name in textbooks to even have her name in the credits of the film as an article called the watermelon woman at 25 in bfi says the watermelon woman shows a supreme disregard for the purity of form proposed an aesthetic of promiscuity but also defacement. Dunye makes a mockery of traditional sites and figures of authority, including herself as a director. Places film and video in a reverent proximity, constantly eschews and reshuffles narrative conventions, and refuses singular truths to affirm the authenticity found in multiplicity, collages, and layering. So as I was saying before, this film is made up of the bits and pieces that were able to be salvaged from the people still alive who were able to remember Faye. We learn from Shirley, who's a lesbian that Cheryl interviews, that Faye was very big in the lesbian club scene and she was very popular with the ladies. <laughs> I'm gonna quote that article um, from the Criterion once more. Scholar Karen D. Wembley writes of the film, the historical import of this identification is multidimensional. Mammy is no longer relegated to stereotypes that would see her as asexual. To the contrary, the Mammy of Dunye's making is young, beautiful and sexually desirable. 
In the same way that we are encouraged to not view this as a traditional film, we are encouraged to divert from the script of society that says this is how life is and there is no changing from that. This film, in using a documentary style, is able to reframe Faye and also reframe the black lesbian experience. So. It doesn't ever seem to detract from the fact that Cheryl is a full person and because she is a full person, a black woman living in America, she experiences stuff that is specific to black women. That includes dehumanisation, it includes being fetishised and it includes police harassment. It is a very brief scene. It does feel kind of out of context. All we see is Cheryl fiddling with her camera, trying to get into a building, and then very suddenly she is harassed by two police officers. And like I said, it does seem like it's out of context, but the film is trying to build up a picture of the ways that Faye's and Cheryl's experiences are similar and that because white supremacy hasn't been properly dismantled, only obscured and pushed to the background, these types of oppression are still present in 1996 and also in 2022. I think the most exciting part of the film is when we learn of June Walker who was Faye's partner for 20 years because it feels as though Cheryl is finally winning because she's been looking the whole film for someone who would be able to talk about Faye in a way that was helpful. We had these different pieces of her and we have the white academics and the people who were part of the film industry but they didn't remember her so it is truly just down to <laughs> the lesbians who knew her from the club scene and that includes her partner June. Unfortunately, and this is, <laughs> this is the saddest thing, we don't get to hear June talk on camera, we instead only get to hear her voiceover when she reads a letter about Faye and we see under the voiceover footage of them old lady lesbians who are a very cute couple and who like I said were together for 20 years. We learn from June who was arguably someone who knew Faye very closely that Faye hated being associated with the title of the watermelon woman. She hated being known as just the mammy character and she hated only being known through the white female director Martha Page. I haven't talked about it, but we learn that she was also supposedly gay and it was rumoured that Faye and Martha had a relationship. We learned that Faye was also frustrated with the fact that she wasn't being seen as a complex person, as a black lesbian who was a talented actress and enjoyed performing at lesbian clubs and enjoyed being with women, being in relationships with women, and that she was frustrated with this fact. I think now would be the time to talk about the ending, because I know I have harped on about how great it is this film is reclaiming black queer history and foregrounding that experience but <laughs> the very last thing we learn in the film is that Faye, the watermelon woman, was not real. That Cheryl did in fact look for people like her and could not find anything. And you know I talked earlier about those reviews who didn't expect the ending and it is true. Like you get enthralled in this film and you're like oh my god this woman sounds amazing. She was so interesting and it's so it's, it's so nice to uncover someone someone like this who was iconic and well remembered by her peers even if she wasn't by historians and then <laughs> and then Dunye just kicked you in the face and was like no this wasn't real I had to make her up because I couldn't find anything. I think even though we do get this kind of reveal this shock that she wasn't real and you know there's there wasn't anyone like her I think what it asks of us really throughout the film is to look at the structures in place that have kept us from remembering women like this and that even though Faye isn't real that there probably were black lesbians who were similar to her who were actresses or singers or people who couldn't be out at the time who couldn't reach their full potential because of racism and misogyny and homophobia prevalent at the time. I think it asks of us 
who have we forgotten? Who has not been remembered in history because people haven't bothered to remember them? And, you know, this film is about Faye, but it's also about Cheryl, who is, you know, she's still alive and she is a black lesbian who is a director and an actress and is, you know, an interesting person and the fact that she made this film made a go down in history as a very iconic person to be remembered so we still have that it's not as if Dunye is saying give up hope I tricked you she wasn't even real Dunye is saying that there were people like Faye there are people like Faye and there will continue to be people like Faye and that just because you haven't been remembered does not mean that you weren't important it definitely doesn't mean that you didn't deserve to be remembered and Dunye proves that. So let me ask the question, does this film look like a badger? I've already mentioned earlier that I kind of wish the stuff with Diana was dug into a little bit more. I understand why it wasn't, I think it would have diverted from the main focus of the film, but I think, you know, looking and criticising whiteness in relation to black lesbians is important to do as white queer people. The way that we relate to race is complex and significant and it needs to be looked at because otherwise massive amounts of tangible harm is done. Again, I understand why she didn't go into massive detail. You don't want to divert from your main subject matter. And the fact that Diana is kind of a footnote in Cheryl's story is very funny. In terms of the whole film, it's revolutionary in terms of its subject matter and who's making it. It's amateurish feel and non-professional actors, they ground the film in ways the new queer cinema movement was meant to do. It made cinema feel accessible, as if anyone could make it. I think that could be off-putting to people. I know some people just want a film to feel very professional and like very traditional, very classical Hollywood. That could put people off. I also feel like some people may feel cheated at the end of the story. I'd hope that <laughs> I'd hope that people would feel okay with the fact that Faye wasn't real. <laughs> like when I watched this film for the first time, I wasn't pissed off. I was just genuinely shocked because I'd sat through this film and become very interested in her and then she just wasn't even a real person. If what you want from your story is realism, <laughs> is um, things in your film to be true, then you may not <laughs> fully enjoy this film. <laughs> People seem to have an issue with the fact that the acting was not great, but that is also kind of the point. It is meant to feel like human beings made it and not super professional actors who were paid lots and lots of money, because I don't think Cheryl Dunye had lots and lots of money to make this film. I think she just hired people she knew. She got her mum to star in it, which is nice. I like that. In terms of recommendations, I have two films, a short film and a feature length film. So the first film is the short film. It's called Pure. It was released in 2021 and it is about a teenage girl who is trying to navigate her identity in a strict culture that values purity from young women. I watched this at BFI Flare Festival last year. I was so blown away by it. I distinctly remember there is a spoken word poetry scene in it, so it's safe to say this film's very gay. So the film is currently on HBO Max. So you can watch it if you have access to that streaming service. The second film is the feature length film. It's on Netflix and it's called The 40 Year Old Version. It follows a black woman who is on the verge of 40 and she's trying to make some significant art. So she tries rapping and she tries to get her play produced and she basically, she keeps coming up against creative roadblocks. It's very good, it's very well performed, it's very interesting. Like The Watermelon Woman, it's a perspective that is not shown often on screen. I think it is important to watch stuff like that, especially if you can access it easily, which you can if you have Netflix. Thank you very much for listening to this episode. I should be doing my next episode in April. The theme for that will be, are you ready for my amazing title? Won't somebody please think of the children? Where I'm going to discuss queer family films. If you'd like to stay updated, please make sure to follow me on Twitter at likeabadgerpod and on Spotify.
If you'd like to see more of my work, you can find me at ambercomwalk.com. Since my last podcast, I've posted two articles, uh, one about Jackass um, and one recommending some films to celebrate International Women's Day. You can check both those out at ambercomwalk.com. If you like my work and you'd like to support me financially, you can donate to my coffee which I will put in the show notes. All of my sources are in the show notes in case you wanted to read more. Thank you again for listening and I hope to see you again in April. Bye!